Since casting is only a very small part of the complete metal cycle, before we look at how the early smiths could have cast their metal artefacts, some background will help us put prehistoric smithing into context. The Copper and Early Bronze Age started in different regions of Europe at varying times. In Balkan countries, such as Bulgaria or the former Yugoslavia, the Copper Age started in the late 6th, early 5th millennium BC. There are some copper mines from the 5th millennium at Rudnaglava in Serbia and Ai Buna in Bulgaria. In Austria, it's not until the 4th millennium BC that we find evidence at the Gürtchenberg that prehistoric smiths carried out some small-scale experiments within the settlement on top of the hill, trying to smelt different ores and to improve their metal by alloying it with arsenic. Also in the 4th millennium BC, Spain and Portugal saw the start of the Chalcolithic period, which is just another way of saying Copper Age. The further north we go, the later the Metal Ages start. In Britain, the earliest limited copper and bronze appeared in the middle of the 3rd millennium BC. The raw material for copper and bronze comes from either copper carbonate ores, such as the beautiful blue azurite, and green malachite, or from sulphidic copper ores like chalcopyrite, or the multicolored peacock ore. First of all, these ores need to be found, and prehistoric prospectors must have constantly been on the lookout for new resources, using only empirical geological knowledge and probably some indicator plants such as C. campion. Depending on the copper-bearing load and the bedrock, the ore was then mined using various open-cast mining methods, or by making deep shafts, as at Rudnaglava. The mining activity left behind characteristic tool marks in the rock, or visibly empty veins, as well as spoil heaps, which are usually full of discarded and broken tools, such as hammerstones. Following mining, the ore was crushed on stone slabs using crushing stones and concentrated, which is also called beneficiation. Smelting of the ore then followed. If it was a sulphidic ore, the smelting was preceded by roasting the ore to drive off as much of the sulphur as possible. Usually smelting processes leave enough evidence behind to lead to discovery of the processing sites. Roasting beds leave an area of scorched earth. Other useful indicators are furnaces or furnace walls. And slag, as well as droplets of copper, crushed ore and gang, charcoal in rich soil and tools. Sometimes, particularly in the very earliest periods, the slag needed to be crushed to get out the copper prills still enclosed in it. Later prehistoric smelters may have managed to obtain pretty pure copper, but it still needed refining to remove the impurities. So, the raw material had already undergone various stages before the smith started to use it for the casting process. First, the hand-sorted copper ore concentrate, together with charcoal and flux, was loaded into the furnace for smelting. Air blasts from bellows brought the temperature up to melting point and bits of the furnace lining would get mixed into the melt. After several hours, the slag, if liquid enough, was tapped or run out of a hole in the side of the furnace, and the liquid copper was run off into a prepared space in front of the furnace. Some of the material wasn't liquid, and this formed furnace slag. It seems that in the earliest periods, liquid slag that could be separated from the liquid copper was hardly ever produced, and furnace slag containing copper prills was the normal end product of a first smelt. This furnace slag then needed to be crushed and hand-sorted to separate any copper prills from the waste slag. The copper and copper prills were then remelted and refined, usually in a crucible using charcoal and air blasts from bellows. If the intended end product was bronze, the copper needed to be alloyed at this stage. 
In the Copper Age or the Chalcolithic, alloying was mostly done by adding arsenic to give what is known as arsenical bronze. Later, in the Bronze Age, tin was used to make bronze proper. Finally, crucible slag is skimmed off and the refined or alloyed copper was run into ingot moulds, ready for transport to the smiths for casting into the required shapes. Before casting can proceed, a pattern has to be made and with it a mould prepared. A wooden pattern excavated at a wet site in Switzerland has now provided proof that prehistoric smiths used wooden models to make their moulds. Moulds were usually made of either sand, clay, stone or metal. Obviously sand moulds leave no trace whatsoever as the sand just reverts back to its original form after use. Clay moulds can be reused, but only a few times, and are mostly found in fragments which survive just as well as pottery because the clay is fired prior to use. However, stone moulds survive well in the archaeological record, as do metal moulds, provided they're not remelted in times of scarcity of raw material. There are two main types of moulds. Open moulds, which result in a flat side to the artefact being cast, and bivalve moulds, which consist of two parts, eliminating the flat-sided effect. Bivalve moulds are used for more complex forms, such as socketed axes, pinheads, or shaft hole axes, such as we will be casting. So for our casting experiment, we'll be preparing a bivalve, or two-part mould, constructed of sand. The pattern we'll use is made of yellow pine, which is easily shaped and fairly stable in damp sand. It's a copy of a shaft hold axe of the 5th millennium BC from the Hungarian cemetery of Titsapolga Bazatania and is typical of axes found in Hungary during the Copper Age. In order to prepare the mould, the model must first be supported. This is done on a bed of sand called an odd side. The drag box, which will hold the bottom of the mould, is positioned on top of the odd side and the pattern is dusted with parting powder to enable easy removal from the finished mould. Facing sand, consisting of used sand with 20% new Mansfield red sand milled in with it, is sieved over the pattern until it is completely covered. The box is then filled with floor or backing sand to about 50 millimetres above the drag box sides. The sand is rammed with the wedge end of a rammer, being careful to avoid hitting the pattern itself. More sand is added if necessary and ramming repeated. Finally, a flat ram is used to compact the sand. And the excess is removed by using a strickle. The drag box is carefully removed from the odd side and turned over. The mould is cleaned up by clearing away any loose sand and smoothing the edges around the pattern. Finally, the edges of the box are cleared of sand to give a good join. The pattern is gently tapped to ease it away from the sand mould. It will become obvious later why the rod is left in position. The top box, or cope box, is positioned on top of the drag box and the pattern is again sprinkled liberally with parting powder. Before positioning the down spruce. This will form the opening to enable pouring of the molten metal into the mould. The whole process is then repeated in exactly the same way as before. First using sieved
facing sand. Then filling the box with floor sand and carefully ramming. Finally, when ramming is completed, the sand is strickled flat and generally tidied. After removing the down spruce tube, the pattern is gently tapped to ease it away from the sand mould, using the rod that was left in position earlier. The mould is then separated by lifting the coat box off the drag box and carefully turning it upside down on the bench. Any excess parting powder is brushed away and the sand around the pattern is wetted before once more tapping the pattern very carefully to loosen it. The pattern is then gently removed from the mould. An ingate is cut into the sand to allow the molten metal to flow from the down spruce into the mould before a final dusting of suitable mould dressing. Excess powder is carefully blown off by using bellows. Next, the core that will create the shaft hole in the axe head is positioned. We know that prehistoric smiths used cores like this because the sensational Nahal Mishmah hoard found in Israel had such a core still in situ inside a cast mace head. Vents are then cut into the sand to allow hot gases to escape and the two halves of the mould, the bottom drag box and the top coat box, are positioned together. Finally, a runner bush is fitted to the top of the down spruce to enable easier pouring of the hot metal. The completed mould is now ready for casting. In the prehistoric period, copper or copper alloys were melted in small crucibles, of which several types are known. The most common in Europe was a ladle with a handle, which was often hollow to facilitate lifting the crucible by inserting a wooden handle. There were also plain crucibles, as illustrated on an Egyptian frieze, which were lifted out of the fire by using greenwood tongs. These crucibles were tempered with large amounts, 50%, of sand or quartz to help them withstand the high temperatures required. Whilst prehistoric smiths had to use charcoal to produce the necessary heat, we're cheating by using a modern gas-fired furnace and a plumbago crucible made from graphite and clay. Pure copper melts at 1,083 degrees Celsius and modern safety precautions demand that we wear protective clothing, particularly goggles, gloves and stout footwear, which obviously wouldn't have been available to the prehistoric smiths. Once the copper is completely molten, the surface slag is skimmed off. Any skimmers or stirrers must be preheated to prevent hydrogen being introduced into the melt. The alloying material is then added, in this case tin, and the mixture stirred. As a safety precaution, all additions to molten metals must be warm and dry. Addition of alloying